All right, this is going to be the first of a series of video lectures that we're going to do throughout the year, and part of your homework grade in this class is going to be watching these videos and taking notes on them so you can come and be prepared for lecture days. Um, first one we're going to talk about is what makes this little guy alive and this poor fella not. In the biological sciences, there are generally eight characteristics of life. I think when you get your zoology book, it's going to tell you there are seven. It depends on who you ask. Um, for our purposes, we're going to say eight, and there's one very special one that I saved for the last. But Ka here, who you'll probably get to meet on Monday, is a living organism in the class reptilia, and the first characteristic of life that he exhibits is that he's made of cells. All right, if you remember from biology, cells are the smallest subunit of life. You can be prokaryotic, you can be eukaryotic, you can be uh, containing organelles. Those organelles can be membrane bound. There are very huge varieties of cells out there, but they are the most basic unit of life. The second one is that you gotta eat. Okay, Ka ate today, which is why you may or may not be able to get to see him on Monday, maybe Tuesday, but you require food to get energy and all animals are heterotrophic, meaning that they have to consume their food. I am going to go very fast in these videos, by the way, uh, just to try to make them short. They're usually going to be somewhere around 10 minutes long. There's a couple towards the end of the semester that might be upwards of 20. Um, that'll be the longest, though. Uh, you'll probably get away with some that are only five minutes long, and I'll talk about how I want you to take notes on these uh, Monday. If you're watching this now, you're probably not, because uh, you're all slackers and probably don't even know that I have a school website, so you'll find out about these videos Monday. But we've got two characteristics of life now, okay? We've got one being that you're made of cells and two being that you require food, okay? And we use that food to make energy, or we convert that food into energy to be more specific. Number three is that you got to maintain homeostasis, okay? Ka here is cold-blooded, so homeostasis is a little more difficult for him. You and I are warm-blooded. And what homeostasis is, I like to call it your happy place. All right? Everything is in equilibrium. Everything is in balance. Right? Your temperature is going to stay whatever you need it to be to survive. In humans, it's 98.6. In Ka, because he's cold-blooded, it's whatever the temperature of his environment is. Um, the chemical pathways in your body must remain in regulation and equilibrium. Uh, things like your salt pathways, which we'll talk about a little bit. If they get out of whack, you can die very quickly. Um, there's a lot that goes on with homeostasis, and it is very important for maintaining life. The next one, and we'll do a couple experiments with zebrafish later on in the year uh, to show this characteristic of life is you have to have the ability to reproduce. Okay, If you don't have that ability, you cannot pass on your genetic information and life kind of doesn't exist that way. Um, number five is that you have to grow and develop. Um, this one's very important for multicellular organisms. Right? Uh, some of you guys saw Ka last year. He hasn't grown very much in the time that I've had him. Okay. Uh, he's a little over a foot long now. When I first got him, he was only about six inches, so he's getting there, but it's taken him in a while. He may not get much longer, okay, but he still will grow and develop. The skull that this dog was taken from stopped growing and developing probably around 40 pounds. Okay, I think this one was from an um, American Eskimo, but I'm not sure. We'll talk a little bit later in the semester when we get to mammals how you can tell the differences there. But So number five is that you have to grow and develop. Number six ties back into number four. Okay, you got to have DNA. All living organisms have DNA, whether you're a plant, fungus, mammal, doesn't matter. Okay, You have DNA. You have some genetic information to make you who you are and to code for the proteins and hormones that help you grow and develop as you age. Number seven you have to respond to a stimuli, okay? Um, for us, we respond to stimuli thousands of times a day. Some organisms may respond to stimuli once in their lifetime, okay? But you have to respond to a stimulus. You have to be able to take some kind of action. Usually this one is reserved for movement, but not all living things move, okay? Um, so we like to call it response to stimuli. And I'll talk a little more about that on our first real lecture day. So that's the first seven. 
we have all organisms are made of cells. They all require food and energy. They all maintain homeostasis. They all reproduce. They all grow and develop. They all have DNA. And they all have the ability to respond to stimuli. The last one is one that I like to include, and I tend to think it's one of the most important characteristics of life, is that you have to have the ability to adapt and evolve over time as a species. Okay? Without this, there's no genetic variation. There's no adaptation to a changing environment. Okay? Uh, there's no way for life to continue without evolution. And we'll talk quite a bit about evolution throughout the year, um, and uh, hopefully I can clear up some misconceptions you may have about the topic. But those are the eight characteristics of life. Hopefully you got all those down. If you didn't, just hit the rewind button and you'll be good. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about, and I'll be done shortly, I don't want to make this a very long video, is what makes an animal an animal. There are a few defining characteristics that make an animal such a thing. All animals are going to be eukaryotic. Uh, if you remember from biology, eukaryotic means that you have true membrane-bound organelles. You have a true nucleus within your cells. Okay? All animals are also going to be multicellular. Now, we will look at some protozoans in this class, okay? but they are not true animals. So while there are single cellular living organisms, all animals are classified as being multicellular. Sorry, somebody's at the door. Um, another defining characteristic is that they are heterotrophic. And if you'll remember when I was rambling at the beginning of the video, heterotrophic means that you've got to consume your food to convert it into energy. You cannot make your own energy. And lastly, unlike plants, all animals lack cell walls. Now, some animals do have a very strong cellular component called chitin, which we'll talk about when we get to invertebrates, but you have no true cell wall. Now, this may be discouraging to some of you because I'm sure you wanted to take this class to learn about bunny rabbits, but 95% of the animal kingdom is composed of invertebrates, meaning they do not have a vertebral column, they do not have a true spinal cord, they do have a nervous system, but not a true spinal cord. All right? Only 5% of the animal kingdom are vertebrates. Now, that does not mean in this class we're going to spend 5% of the time talking about vertebrates, but the vast majority of animals on the planet are invertebrates, and that's not just insects. Um, you will learn the difference between the different types of invertebrates as we go throughout the year. A large portion of the class is talking about invertebrates if you look at your syllabus, though. Now, 